Good morning, and can I welcome everyone to the eighth meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018? And can I please remind everyone present to turn our mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? We have received apologies for today's meeting from Richard Lockhead due to a family bereavement, and Claire Adamson is attending today in his place. Mary Fee has indicated that she were alive later in the meeting as she is currently attending another committee that she sits on. The first item of business is a decision on whether to take Agenda Item 3 in private, which is a review of today's evidence. Is everyone content that Agenda Item 3 is taken in private? Thank you. The next item of business is the first of our series of three Ask the Minister evidence sessions. Today we will hear from the Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science and Government officials. The session will mainly focus on widening access. And can I welcome Shirley Ann Somerville, Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science, Dr Paul Smart, Head of Colleges, Young Workforce and SFC Sponsorship Division, and Dr Roddy MacDonald, Head of a Higher Education and Science Division, Scottish Government. I understand, Minister, that you would like to make a short opening statement. Thank you, Convener, and I am very happy to appear before the Committee this morning to discuss widening access to higher education and um, other issues that the Committee uh, sees fit. Um, as I set out in Parliament yesterday, I believe that education is by far the most effective means we have to improve the life chances of our young people. The Scottish Government is firmly committed to equity and excellence in higher education and to ensuring that every young person, no matter their background, can access learning that will provide them qualifications, and the same should apply for adult returners to the system as well. I am also clear that widening access is not just about access to Freshers' Fair, but to Graduation Day and beyond, ensuring that students from the most deprived communities in Scotland are supported to achieve their aspirations into, through and beyond higher education is core to that. As you are aware, the Commission on Widening Access reported in March 2016, making 34 recommendations which were accepted in full by the Scottish Government. Since the publication of the Blueprint for Fairness, we have made good progress by appointing the Commissioner for Fair Access, embedding our targets within university outcome agreements, introducing a full non-repayable bursary of £7,625 for young care experienced students and establishing an access delivery group to oversee delivery. The purpose of that group, which I chair, is to enable quarterly reporting on the coordination and implementation of delivery of the Commission's recommendations, as well as providing a forum for strategic discussion with sector-wide stakeholders on widening access. The group brings together all those with the responsibility for delivery of the recommendations, those leading delivery projects and other uh, key stakeholders. Members include representatives of higher education and further education sectors, students, schools in early years and the Commissioner for Fair Access, who is an observer. As you will be aware, the Commissioner published his first annual report in December, which made 23 recommendations. These mostly built on areas which were in the Commission on Widening Access, but did identify some new areas for consideration as well. These recommendations for the Scottish Government, Scottish Funding Council and universities present challenge to us all to drive further and faster with widening access, and rightly so. I set out my response to the Commissioner's report in Parliament yesterday, addressing the Commissioner's request for clarity on government priorities with regards to our targets and ambitions for access. I made clear that our priority is for access for learners of all ages, and our current priority is for access to university, where the greatest inequalities lie. I also made clear my support for his recommendations on articulation, bridging programmes, contextualised admissions, and fully accepted the Commissioner's recommendations for the Scottish Funding Council. To support, the Scottish Government, to support this, the Scottish Government has delivered a real terms increase in the budget for higher education, protecting the principle of both free tuition and widening access, and ensuring that further progress can be made. As I said, good progress is being made. Last year, we saw a 13 per cent increase in the number of Scots from our most deprived communities getting a place at a Scottish university. That means over 600 additional people from our most deprived communities being accepted to study at university. Figures published just last week also show that the percentage of school leavers going to higher education from the 20 per cent most deprived areas in Scotland has increased to its highest level in six years. However, I am clear there is more to do if we are to reach our targets and realise our ambitions. So I will continue to ensure that I do all I can to make that happen in government, in the Funding Council and across the sector itself. And I am happy to take members' questions. Thank you. 
Thank you, Minister. You, you'll be aware, Minister, that the committee invited suggestions from members of the public for today's session with you. So, before I invite questions from members of the committee, I'd like to start by asking a question we've received from one of those members of the public. Rachel Devaney would like to know what work has been carried out to ensure that students who obtain university places but remain at home and commute to university or work part-time are able to access the full range of services offered by higher education institutions and other agencies, such as mental health facilities and financial advice, as most of the work seems to be focused on those who move away from home. Well, it is very important that any institution looks at all of their students, regardless of where they live or where they came from. The universities and indeed colleges have an obligation uh, to look after their students. Uh, so we would expect services to, to be available whether you reside on campus um, or, or stay at home. Now, there will be different challenges for a student who doesn't uh, reside on campus, and I've spoken to, to young people uh, in their sixth year thinking about going to university, whether they want to leave home uh, to go into halls or whether they want to stay at home. And we do know that if you're commuting back and forward to university, you may feel that you are uh, missing out on some of the social supports uh, that, that are there. Uh, I do know this is something that universities take very seriously um, as well. So I think Rachel raises a, a very, very important point. I think it's something that the universities are aware of and something that we're, we're very keen um, as, a, as a government and through the funding council to ensure we're analysing when it comes to, for example, uh, mental health or the Equally Safe project to protect students uh, within their uh, study environment. Can I ask, Phil, and, and I, can, I get the whole social thing, that's clearly just the price you pay for deciding to, to stay at home. Uh, but the, the, why would there be any difference in mental health facilities or financial advice? Well, there shouldn't be, but there may be a perception, um, certainly identified within young people, because they simply commute in, go to a class and then travel home, that they're not taking part in the wider campus experience, which gives them um, perhaps a greater feeling of belonging to a community. The universities and indeed colleges are very keen to ensure that that community feel is brought to, to, to all students. Uh, so if there is a, a feeling within students that they're they don't have the same access, then that's something that, that needs to be dealt with, because there certainly should be a universal support for all our students. appreciate that. There's, there's a, a number of questions have come in from members of the public, and I'm sure they won't all get asked today, but our intention is to write to you, Minister, with the questions and then get the responses back to those that, that participated in it. Thank you very much. Uh, Liz? Thank you, Convener. Um, throughout uh, Sir Peter Scott's uh, recommendations, there has been the need to look at the bigger picture uh, of higher education and the fact that uh, the widening access policy does, doesn't focus necessarily on SIMD 20 students that can affect um, a whole range of students. Um, could I ask you, um, given what you said yesterday, is the Scottish Government minded to free up the number of funded places, to increase the number of funded places in the system so that there is no potential displacement? Well, as I, I think I said um, yesterday in the chamber, there is uh, not um, an evidence of displacement at the moment. There is a fear of displacement, and that's indeed something which the, the Commissioner said. Um, I, I would, however, um, suggest that we need to get back to basics slightly on this. And what we're needing to do when it comes to widening access is actually change the system. You can extend a system to infinity and it doesn't necessarily make it fair. We have an unfair system at the moment and an unfair um, um, displacement when we look at the publicly funded places when it comes to um, universities. Um, that's why we need to look at making systemic change within it. Um, when you look at the system that we have at the moment, uh, we see a variety of different ways that institutions can look uh, to tackle widening access. We have um, universities who are taking this uh, um, really uh, the pace very quickly. Um, for example, um, Aberté, who are looking at contextualised admissions and making those changes. Um, the recent um, correspondence I've had from, from Aberté suggests that um, they actually had 107 students joining them in September, 
uh, receiving an offer of reduced qualifications. Um, 63 needed that lower offer to gain admitted to university. They have changed their system systemically because they recognised that the system was unfair. I would compare that to another university, uh, which I won't name, who, when they were concerned about widening access, suggested uh, to me that the best way to tackle that was to give them more places. Now, you can either change the system to make it fair, such as Aberté have, or you can look to just continue extending an unfair system. I want to change the system to make it fair. And I think that way people will be reassured about who goes to university, and it's based on a fairness and a level playing field, regardless of where you come from. Uh, thank you for that, Minister. Having said that, there are many who think there is an unfairness in the current structure and the funding structure, because obviously there are Scottish Government funded places and there are uh, places available to those students who are playing fees from international and uh, from the rest of the UK dimension. So that there's an inherent um, difference in the way that the money comes into the university. Now, the point that Sir Peter is raising is that if there are specific targets of the 20% from SIMD 20 by 2030, unless there are more funded places available, there will be displacement. That's a fact. Well, what's, your, what's the Scottish Government's answer to that? Well, my answer would be that um, last year we actually saw a 13% increase in the number of students from the most deprived communities, as I said in my opening statement. Um, and we also saw overall a record number of Scots accepted to university. So that would tend to counter the argument that people were displaced. We saw an increase in the number of those from deprived communities and we saw an increase overall in the number of Scots going to university. So I hear the concerns um, around displacement. Um, I understand um, that there will be those concerns there. But I think the way to deal with that is not to continuously look to tinker with the system, but to make the system fair. I hope we would all want a system that's fair for every young person or adult returner to get into a university place. So what we're looking at is using the publicly funded places that we have in a fair manner, creating a level playing field that will ensure everyone has the opportunity to get to the university of their but, choosing. But with respect, Minister, there, there are uh, students out there who've come out of school who are very well qualified, domiciled Scottish students, who are finding it increasingly difficult to get into university despite some of the improving trends. And because they are finding it more difficult to get into university, it will be some of these students who are well qualified who will be displaced by the system unless there are more funded places available. Is that not correct? Well, when you look at Qualifications, and you've talked about people who are, are, are well qualified. Um, I, I would caution against the fact that qualifications are the only way to determine whether um, a young person or adult returner should get to a university. Um, it's been, I think, now widely accepted that uh, qualifications are only one part of a person's story when they're applying for university. So, yes, qualifications are exceptionally um, important, um, and we should um, encourage uh, young people to, to continue to aspire to, to gain high qualifications. But they are only one part of the story. Uh, this is about ensuring that we have a fair system, uh, that uh, those who perhaps don't have the same level of qualifications uh, but have an equal um, ability to go to a university and succeed in a university uh, have that ability to go to university. So this is about taking the qualifications but also then looking at the wider picture of what a person presents to a university. That's a fair way of looking at it, rather than just looking at perhaps one more traditional aspect, which thinks the only way to measure the success that a person has is through the um, exams that they've passed within their school time. Uh, Minister, I completely accept that it's not just all about qualifications, it's about the much broader picture of a student. That, that actually has always been the case. Um, what, what I'm getting at is that that story, as you describe it, could be very a strong story for some students who are very well qualified, domiciled Scots, who, because of the widening access policy within a, a very severely capped policy, will not have the same ability to get into university as they have just now. What would you say to a student or their parents or a teacher who finds that they are displaced by that system? 
uh, th we do have a cap within uh, places for, for Scottish and EU students. Uh, we have increased the number um, of places since 2013, and we've particularly made an increase in the numbers uh, for those from widening access and um, articulation. So this is something that we will continue uh, to look at. What I would say to any young person, adult returner, um, and their families is that this government is determined to create a fair system where everyone will have an opportunity to go to university if it is the right, uh, the right avenue for them to go to, and that system will be a fair one. And I think if we have a fair system, uh, then that would surely be um, a level playing field that we can all um, ag agree, I hope, um, is the right way to go about things. Context, Minister, as my last one. In that context, Minister, you're not ruling out removing the cap and increasing funded places? Well, as I said yesterday, the, the decisions around uh, capping and the number of places um, is taken through the, the annual uh, budgetary process. That's the, the way that, that, that these uh, decisions are carried out on, on an annual basis. What I also said yesterday is that universities and the, and the sector shouldn't wait and hope that there will be a change to a cap or a change and a decrease in demand from elsewhere as a way to widening access. We are requiring systemic change within the system and that's what we're determined to see. Does, uh, two members want to ask short supplementaries, Joanne and then Gillian. Thanks. I'm not quite sure why the cap should be determined by the budget process rather than by educational policy, but that's maybe something we can explore further. I think there's a danger of conflating two separate issues here. One is about the consequence of actively choosing to address the question that young people, some young people, are not operating a level playing field, and that's how I see widening access is restoring the balance and making it fair for them. But on the other side, the cap, if you have a cap on places, I wonder whether you would accept the view the danger we end up in a place where, and this is not about displacement because young people are, are unfairly getting access to a place, there is comp competition for certain courses, which means as a consequence that we're having rationing by qualification. So that maybe five, ten years ago you would have access to a course that you can no longer do simply because of the cap. Is this something the Scottish Government is prepared to look at? Well, the reasons it's connected to the budget process is obviously that the, the number of uh, places therefore has a, a, a financial uh, requirement for us to, to fund. So we need to, to look at uh, um, any decision that would be changing to on, on the cap would obviously have a financial implication, and that's for uh, the Scottish Government and indeed for opposition parties to put forward uh, proposals if they wish to see the cap increase. So there is a financial um, respect follow policy decisions. Well, so you, you, you make the policy decision and then you work out the funding. You don't say, well, we don't have a view on the cap. The budget will determine that. And I'm asking, the serious question here is, there are young people who are telling, or I've been told, it's more difficult to get into university of certain courses now than it was 10 years ago if you're a Scottish student. I'm assuming you don't think that's acceptable. Are you willing to look at the unintended consequences of a cap which is resulting in competition for places and therefore rationing by qualifications which would not have applied five, ten years ago. Well, I'm certainly not saying that the budget determines um, what we do within the universities. What I am saying is if, um, if any party wants to, to change the, the level of, of capped places, that that has a financial implication. So absolutely, we should determine the policy, but then recognise that there is a financial implication to that. Um, I, I do appreciate the, the point that Joanne Lamont's making I, um, around um, what's sometimes been called grade inflation, where the, the, the challenges of, of getting on a particular course um, have increased when demand has increased. That's why um, it's very important that we look at um, minimum entry standards, when we look at contextualised admissions, uh, that the universities are, are starting to take that um, on board. And we want to see further and indeed increased pace of change in that. So to deal with the, the very, um, the, very um, uh, the same concern that Joanne Lamont has around the ability to get on to, to different courses, um, there are different methods of, of um, achieving that. One of the aspects around widening access is to look to um, what uh, the minimum um, entry standards um, that a young person or adult returner would require um, to be successful on, on that course. And that's something which has been looked at within the framework of widening access. Julian? I'm going to ask you 
more about articulation later on in the session, but it seems to me that there's a situation here where we've only got five um, universities really getting involved in the articulation of HND and HNC into getting into university later on, maybe second or third year. If more other universities did that, we would not have a situation where the funding could be allocated diff in different ways to actually allow a situation where you would have more places available in first year because you've been at this articulation route. Um, would that be a fair comment? Well, I, I think articulation has a, a number of benefits. It benefits the, the student because it recognises uh, the level of study that they've already completed and it doesn't require them, if they have full articulation, to repeat necessarily um, a, a year within that. So it's the right thing to do for the student. You're also point, right to point out that it makes a smarter use of the system. So if you uh, can ensure that um, a student can get into second year or indeed get into third year uh, within a course, we're making better use of the, the funded places that we have available. Um, you're also right to point out that there are um, a, a relatively few of the universities um, who have widespread uh, full articulation um, and the more that we can encourage that um, the more that we can see that being taken on board by the colleges and universities, which they are indeed looking at, uh, then the better it will be for the students. And I would, I would suggest it would be better for the colleges and universities as well in terms of the usage of, of publicly funded places within the entire system. Uh, Liz, you were wanting to ask No, I want to come back uh, later, if I may. Uh, it's on the question about data, which I think yeah, is... Well, uh, is, uh, is, is, is nice. OK. Um, uh, yesterday, uh, Minister, we had an exchange about some of the data set that uh, universities um, told this committee, as did uh, some of the uh, principals who were in front of us uh, last year, uh, that they feel doesn't exist. And could I ask you again, just in relation to what you answered to uh, Joanne Lamont's uh, question about um, minimum entry requirements, I think what the universities are looking for is even if it's not last year's information about the, the number of S6 pupils in the SIMD um, quintile that do actually, uh, they want to know what their actual qualifications have been as a trend so that it makes it easier for the universities to assess what their minimum entry requirements could be. Now that data I would have thought should be available. Could you tell us what the time scale is when you think that universities will get that, because I think it's a very important point about offering minimum entry requirements to SIMD 20 pupils. Absolutely. And following uh, our exchange in the chamber yesterday, I, I did uh, look into this further with officials. Um, unfortunately, this is uh, one of the aspects that, that seemed to um, have been dealt a blow because of the, uh, the, the poor weather last week. Uh, there was actually due to be um, a, a data working group uh, on Friday, um, which was to take some of that attainment data to the data working group, which has University Scotland representation on that, and start working through that uh, system. Uh, so I understand that that's now been rearranged for this Friday. Um, so that will be the first um, um, opportunity that that working group will have had to meet. Now, that's not the only aspect which that working group will, will look at. There's a number of issues when it comes to data um, that that, will, uh, that group will want to investigate. But the, the um, request from universities to look at attainment data um, is something which will be presented to, to that working group. And as I say, it actually should have been uh, done last uh, Friday if anyone had been able to make it to, uh, I think, Glasgow. I think that's very helpful, Minister, because there, there, presumably there is that data available from you know, the last sort of eight, ten years, I would have thought. Um, and it's important that when, when in, different institutions are setting their minimum entry requirements, as distinct from the thresholds, um, that that data would be extremely helpful to the universities to know what um, SIMD students uh, are likely to have. So it, the more that that can be speeded up, I think the, the better it will be. Well, the information is, is available. I would say it, it, it's not easily available. Uh, the analysts have, have worked um, very hard to ensure that this is, um, is av made available uh, from the request from universities. But I would go back to the point that I, I did make to, to Liz Smith yesterday. Um, we don't have to wait to get this data to get moving on widening access. Universities um, may wish to see this data so that they can look at attainment levels. They may want to see the data so they can analyse um, where they think 
uh, the demand for places um, will, will go. But this does not stop them um, changing to minim minimum entry requirements. This does not stop them moving on widening access. So while this data may be interesting, I'm sure it will be insightful, um, and, it, and it may indeed um, assist universities in the future, there is absolutely no reason, as demonstrated by the Abertay example, which I mentioned earlier, why universities just can't get on and, and deal with contextualised admissions um, and, and minimum entry requirements with, it, with, with that data not being available. Okay. I, I, to be fair to them, I don't think they're actually saying that they want to stop that um, process, because I think a lot of them have worked very hard uh, to get there. What, what, what they're asking for in context of what Sir Peter Scott said when he said that the data set was not complete, and that's what... Um, uh, Petra Vend and Sally Mapstone and uh, Susan Stewart said when they came to this committee that they feel that there should be more data available and it's particularly relevant to get that data that we're talking about for the SIMD quintile. Yeah, and I, I gave the, the commitment to Sally Mapstone, I think at the first, perhaps not the, if not the second meeting of the Access Delivery Group, which it, she sits on along with Petra and, uh, and Susan to, to ensure that we'll do everything that we can to make sure that data is made available for them uh, for them to, to analyse. Uh, but we will progress in the meantime with the information that we have because we know that we need to make those changes now. Thank you. Claire? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, I've been um, obviously reading up on some of the evidence that's been given to committee, um, uh, not being a committee member, um, on a full-time basis. So um, I was really interested uh, in some of the evidence around the social index of multiple deprivation, what we've talked quite a bit about today. And I understand that um, you need to be able to benchmark and measure and evidence the success of the process of widening access. But there will be people, um, because that's a geographical definition and not a personal experience definition, who don't um, fall into that category, but may well suffer from um, <coughs> deprivation in, in every, every sense that um, someone living in those areas would. I just wondered if there was any plan to widen the reach of the fair access to, to, to cover um, people in those situations and and really just to get your, your own views on the strengths and weaknesses of, of that as a benchmark. Well, the Commission on Widening Access did look very much into the, the, the strengths and weaknesses of it. Um, and I think it would be fair to say they recognised there was weaknesses um, within a system that's based on, on area deprivation and they recognised that that does uh, provide some limitations to, to how... Um, um, we can analyse and, and develop policy from that. They did, however, come to the conclusion that, that it was the best available um, data source that we had, and that's why um, the, the Commission recommended uh, that it was used for uh, targets and for analysis of widening access. But we do recognise that there, there needs to be further work on that. Uh, the data working group that I mentioned uh, to, to Liz Smith um, is, is the, the group that will look at um, other aspects, um, whether it's uh, free school meals, whether it's um, individual indicators, uh, to analyse that different uh, data to see um, what, uh, what analysis of that brings out. Um, again, I would go back to the point, however, that yes, um, it does have its limitations when we use um, SIMD. Yes, it's not the perfect measurement of it, but the Commission has determined that it's the, the best measurement that we have and we should continue pressing on at pace with widening access. While we look, while the data working group looks at different aspects uh, to see whether there are um, different individual markers that can be used, whether there's different ways of analysing the system so that we're getting a better range of information out, both for, uh, for the Funding Council, for government in making its policies, and for institutions to be able to, 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 um, to meet their targets and to ensure that their outreach work is working properly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Tavish, you wanted to come in on this and then you need... Learning. Just on, can I, on the learning journey? Yeah. yeah um, yeah, can I ask about, uh, if I may, Minister, about the unique learner number? A, is it still a commitment, and B, when? Well, we are committed to looking very seriously um, at this uh, issue. Um, I know Sir Peter Scott discussed it with the committee um, in a fair bit of detail when he was before you a few weeks ago. Um, officials are, are looking at how this can be taken forward, uh, but it is a very uh, complex issue. 
um, Sir Peter Scott and um, other stakeholders have um, suggested some of the advantages that a unique um, learner um, number would have. Uh, but I would, however, um, say that it is um, a very sensitive issue. We are, um, in essence, um, looking at considerations around what data is collected, um, who it's seen by, um, and in effect, we're talking about um, you know data sharing across the education sector. That's not something which should ever be taken um, and done lightly. We need to be very aware around the sensitivities of th around that. So, um, yes, stakeholders have seen. Um, advantages to a unique learner uh, a un unique learner number uh, and uh, they are absolutely right to do so and um, what officials will also look at though is the sensitivities um, around that um, and uh, the challenges of bringing a system in so we will look at both the advantages and disadvantages of that and ministers will uh, take a, a decision on that in due course um, I totally understand there's, as it were, small L liberal arguments uh, one way, and indeed the small L liberal arguments one way in terms of data sharing, and which we've been through in other, in other areas, shall we say, of late and that kind of thing. But um, Professor, Professor Scott did set out some pretty decent arguments in favour of it, including the, you know, the tracking of any individual through the system, so we actually understand um, the, the best way to support that individual and the best choices that individual can make. I mean, do you think these arguments actually outweigh the? the concerns, quite understandable concerns, that do exist on data sharing and, indeed, in fairness, the complexity of a system. But it's pretty complex at the moment. We don't track people at all at the moment. Well, I, I, do, I do appreciate where Sir Peter Scott um, is coming from on this issue. He is looking at this through a policy perspective of um, what would make it easier um, to track a, a young person um, or, indeed, someone who's returning to, to, to um, the education system uh, to, to track them um, through, through that learner journey. Um, however, um, I, I wouldn't in any way diminish um, the sensitivities and complexities um, around um, data sharing, as I'm sure I, I don't have to um, uh, tell this committee in particular. Um, so what I would reassure the committee about, though, is um, we are ensuring when we are asking officials to look at this in great detail, that um, we can complete our widening access um, outcomes, we can complete our learner journey outcomes, even if a unique learner number was not in place. So while there may be advantages to it, um, it's not a barrier to widening access, it's not a barrier to what we're looking at through the, the learner journey work um, for, for those to actually happen. Okay, I mean, you used that wonderful ministerial phrase in due course, which I may have used in the past myself, but the, um, uh, what does that actually mean? I mean, I'd rather we took a decision and decided this wasn't the right thing to do for, for the reasons that uh, you may or may not yet fully have, uh, or because there's no point in us still being here in a year's time saying this could be one option for when Peter Scott comes again and says, why haven't they done anything about it? So is this going to be something that we'll try to make a decision on in the course of the next number of months? Well, I think the Deputy First Minister said recently that we're looking to um, report back on some of the learner journey work or indeed the, the learner journey work uh, within the coming months. So I would expect the unique uh, learner number to be part of that work as well. So but I hope that helps. With any luck before the summer recess so that Parliament's updated as to what's happening on the learner journey work. Indeed. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you, Navis. Uh, Ruth? Good morning, Minister. Um, I'd like to ask you a bit more about... Um, retention and then there's a question another question that's come in to the committee um, I think one of the things that that struck me the most were the um, facts that um, our students from disadvantaged or non-traditional backgrounds were less likely to stay until second year more likely to obtain a general degree rather than honors and less likely to get a first or a, or a two one now, you were quite clear in your statement that widening access isn't just about um, Freshers' Week, it is about success um, at university. So I suppose I'd just like to hear a little bit more um, about what the Scottish Government is doing and can do. In particular, um, in the Chamber yesterday, in answer to one of my own questions, you said um, that you were looking to intensify the outcome agreement process. Um, and that would include more ambitious and t challenging targets around retention. I wonder if you could just expand on that. It is something which um, I have made part of um, my um, discussions with university principals right from the, the very first meeting uh, that, that I had with them. Um, and there is a, 
a, a level of, of understanding and awareness of, of this within the sector, uh, that this is something which does need uh, to be looked at. One of the, the, um, the areas that I've been um, keen to encourage intensification on, therefore, is around um, retention and the outcomes um, of graduates. And when we're talking about intensification of the outcome agreements, I think um, Audit Scotland, when they've uh, previously looked at outcome agreements, um, have uh, suggested uh, that uh, we need to to look to use those in a more robust manner sometimes, um, that we need to ensure that they are detailed enough without being too wordy and asking about anything. So when we're looking at intensification, what we're trying to do is focus down on key issues um, and then ensure that we're driving um, very serious um, progress on that. Now, there has to be a clear line of sight from my policy priority about retention and outcomes to the Funding Council through my letter of guidance and then to separate institutions through their outcome um, agreements. Um, we're ensuring that decisions on, on, on funding and activities in key areas are therefore looked at through that letter of guidance and through the outcome agreement process. So we're being very um, detailed in the work that we're doing around um, retention and around outcomes to challenge the universities to go further uh, than they are at, at the moment. Now, as I say, many universities are already doing exceptionally good work um, around uh, retention, but we need to see that on a systems-wide basis. Um, the, the figures which the, the Commissioner brought forward within his report uh, make for, for very sobering reading, um, and that's why I'll continue within my letter of guidance this year uh, to look to see if uh, more needs to be done around intensification um, uh, for um, retention and, and outcomes in particular. Okay, thank you. Um, in giving evidence to um, the committee, the Commissioner mentioned that um, some of the changes would almost be, uh, need to be an attitude and culture. And he spoke about um, the notion um, in the States of stepping out of education rather than dropping out and that thing of, of you know, being able to return. And I, and I suppose that the, the, the key thing is that the challenges you have as a, as a, as a young person, if that's around your, your <coughs> life, they don't disappear when you go to university. Do you think there needs to be a more flexible approach? I think one of the, the, the fascinating examples um, that I've had when we've been doing work in the learner journey, which Tavi Scott mentioned when I've been speaking to young people within uh, the work groups, is around young people who have came back to university because either they, um, they went on a course and decided it wasn't the right one for them, or indeed they shouldn't have been to university in the first place, and actually the best place for them was at a college because that was where their career wanted to um, develop. So this idea that um, we have a, a system in many ways which presumes a linear projection through fifth year, sixth year, up through four years of universities isn't how real life is for many of our young people, and it certainly doesn't make it easy for adult returners um, to, to get back into it. Now, there's nothing in the system that prevents young people um, from leaving a university and coming back in, uh, but it's not necessarily easy and it's not necessarily transparent. So through the learner journey, I think it is showing up how we have a system that um, often assumes um, a nice, uh, simple linear projection for people as they work their way through the education system. And if that isn't how real life is for a young person, the, the system needs to be flexible enough to allow them to do that. So I, I found um, Sir Peter Scott's um, discussions around the phrase dropping out um, um, exceptionally interesting. Um, and it, it is something which um, we should look at within uh, the access delivery group. Thank you. Um, if I may, I'll just um, do one of our, uh, the questions that was sent in to us. This um, resonated with me as I have um, a, a young constituent at the moment who's, who's um, looking at his next destination, having, having been at the Blind School. The question is from Elaine Brackenridge, who's head teacher at the Royal Blind School in Edinburgh. Um, and she emailed it in, and her question is, Disabled pupils, including those who are vision impaired, still need more support to ensure that they have the same chances to progress to university or college as other pupils. 
What is the Scottish Government doing to ensure pupils who are blind or partially sighted are provided with the independent living skills to allow them to study at college or university and to support more disabled pupils into entering further and higher education? Well, I know that disability is um, an area that the Commissioner has um, said that he will look at within his work programme um, this year. Uh, but it is very important that we support um, every young person, um, and that includes uh, those that have a disability to get into to college or university. So, for example, um, there is the um, disability support allowance that is available for young people um, or, or for anyone who, who wants to, to get to, to university. Um, that is a demand-led budget, um, and therefore it, it is um, um, are, um, available for, for any student who, who needs to um, access those, those funds um, to go to higher education. We also, uh, through the, the Scottish Funding Council, um, provide another £2.5 million uh, to universities um, directly to ensure that they are making um, changes uh, to um, to assist those with a disability to to go to uh, university. So there's um, absolutely a, a commitment to ensure that um, all students, regardless of um, the, you know their background or or um, what school they are at, have an ability to, to get to university. And it would of course include that school too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, George. Mina, good morning, Minister. My question is the same question I asked the Commissioner a couple of weeks ago. Consistently, my time in the committee now and previously, uh, we had a situation where UWS and Paisley and uh, Glasgow Cali and OU are consistently good at getting uh, pupils from uh, the lower 20% band to attend. UWS have hit the 20% figure on numerous occasions. Now, there would be an argument made by these institutions that should there not be, uh, when you're looking at funding and taking things forward, should there not be a case that they are actually delivering the government policy and at the same time they're actually giving the support that's needed in the second and third year when these young people are going to university. And their argument would be, is there not a way we could look at that to actually support them more to ensure that they can continue delivering what the government wants? Well, as I said yesterday in my, my statement, I'm very clear that when we're talking about widening access to university, I mean all universities, um, I do recognise that um, the, the level of um, SIMD 20 um, entrance into universities it does vary, and it varies quite significantly. Um, and you're quite right to, to point out to... Um, to, to me, the, the strides that have been taken um, by UWS uh, and others um, around this area. It is therefore very important as we look for each institution to fulfil its target that it has been set by the Commission, that that is each institution will be asked to do that. We will not achieve our national widening access targets um, solely on the hard work that's already gone in um, through UWS or Glasgow Caledonian and continue to ask them to do more. We will ask them um, to, to continue uh, to do more on the widening access agenda, um, but only but rec recognising the work that they've gone before. So I think each university has its own challenges uh, within this, whether it's around uh, the applications, whether it's around entrance, whether it's around uh, retention or outcomes. So we will ask each university uh, to look at um, their statistics and to see what more can be done. But there will be um, a specific um, push um, to ensure that those universities um, who aren't perhaps um, um, achieving their 10% target already are encouraged to do so. And when we look at actually the, the, the number of people uh, that it would require some of those universities to get up to their 10% target, it's actually not that many. Uh, so that's why we will continue to push every single um, institution. And we'll, of course, be in discussions with uh, UWS and indeed every other university um, through the outcome agreement process to ensure that when we're doing so, we're taking into, uh, we're taking into consideration the work that's already gone on before uh, and continuing just to ensure that everyone um, um, does the best that they can through those, those four measures that I spoke about. 
one of the things, Minister, that when I asked the same question to Sir Peter Scott, that he brought up was the fact that he suggested that uh, UWS, Glasgow Cali and OU it might have been a cultural uh, thing as well, that people from background, poorer backgrounds would be able to identify more with these institutions than other ones. I think he used the line that robes and bonnets are not maybe uh, for people from the likes of me. Uh, to go to, you know, so it's, uh, and I can understand that argument. So is there not a role as well while keeping the ancient kind of traditions of many of the institutions, but at the same time, maybe looking at the cultural role they can take and not being so threatening to individuals uh, going to some cases who've been away from home for the first time? <laughs> I, I, I did hear Sir Peter Scott's um, evidence um, um, around uh, robes. I'm presuming he's, he's meaning um, St Andrews in, in, in that context. Um, we don't want any of our ancient universities to lose any of their tradition, any of them what makes them world-class institutions where people from across the world want to come and study. But we also want people to come from Paisley or my hometown, Kirkcaldy, and feel that they're also welcome in St Andrews or indeed any other of our ancients. Uh, the, the new principal at St Andrews is um, a lady who takes this um, issue very seriously. She is looking at what more can um, be done to ensure that, um, that people see... Um, St Andrews for the great institution that it is and I'm encouraged to go there. Um, individuals will pick their universities for a, a variety of, of different, different reasons. It's a very individual um, choice that young people um, and adult returners will make, uh, but they need to know that they'll be welcome and indeed supported throughout their course wherever they choose to go. Final question, uh, uh, just as it's on. SIMD, my constituency, Ferguson Park, has constantly said it's the area of worst deprivation, but SIMD, by its very uh, way it measures, is the fact it's only two or three streets in Ferguson Park that are like that. But my question's more along the lines of uh, how do we, how do we actually, using Ferguson Park as an example, how do we make sure that that young person with the dreams and aspirations that they, they're born with, like everyone else has, how do we make sure, and how do you as a minister, ensure that by the time they're 15, 16, they're still looking uh, aspirationally, looking to universities, possibly St Andrews or somewhere else? How do we culturally get that person or that young person, that young man, that young woman into that position? Well, I think it's important that we do look at this in a whole systems approach, and that's when we're looking, why we're, when we're looking at the access delivery group, um, that we're um, very sure that we have people on that that represent um, um, secondary schools, primary schools, um, and, and councils, because what we want to do is ensure that the work that we're doing around um, around outcome agreements, around the work that we're doing around outreach is, is genuinely um, effective. So the Scottish Funding Council um, has uh, work where it goes into to schools. Um, each university will have its own outreach work where it goes into to schools. Um, and what the, the um, framework for, for um, fair access um, will look at is actually the effectiveness of what's going on. There's an exceptional amount of hard work that happens at every institution, but do we know if it makes a difference? Um, or or uh, do we know if it actually changes a young person's perceptions of themselves and of their ability to go? Um, I would also, within this context, um, stress, however, um, a point that I made yesterday. It's about ensuring that everybody at school, from a very, very early age, um, has the confidence to pick what's right for them. And in some cases, that will be university. In other cases, it will be a college, it will be an apprenticeship, or it will be moving into employment. Each of those is equally valued. Equal, um, each of those is, is the correct course for that young person to go down if it's right for them. So we need to ensure that the people that are, are growing up within um, your constituency and across Scotland um, do know that university is for them, that they can go to university, uh, but then they pick what's right for them and what's right for what they want to do. But we need to give them the confidence to do that. That's why we're looking at our outreach work through the Funding Council um, and also the, the framework um, for Fair Access Group will look at what happens in the totality to ensure that that money is being spent wisely. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can I just say before I move on to, to, to Oliver that I saw a photo of George in a bonnet yesterday and he looked very fetching. It wasn't a St Andrews one right enough, but don't do yourself down like that, George. Uh, Oliver. Thank you, uh, convener. I'm, I'm interested and I, I do fully support the position uh, the Minister set out in, t in terms of inspiring confidence in young people, but is there not also a practical consideration uh, that, that goes alongside that about giving them uh, the, the opportunities to get the qualifications they actually need uh, to get into university. I asked yesterday um, about advanced hires, um, and I just wondered uh, if any analysis had been done um, on the provision of advanced hires and hires in schools in uh, SI, MD20 uh, areas, um, and also from a constituency perspective, what uh, provision there was in smaller rural secondary schools. Well, it is something um, which is is very um, important that we analyse, again, going back to the whole systems um, approach, that when a young person decides that they want to go to university to study a particular course, then they're able to access the courses at school that will allow them to do that. We're seeing um, a lot of collaboration between different high schools. Um, we're seeing, um, for example, in, in Glasgow, within the Glasgow Caledonian Hub, um, um, another way of, of um, ensuring that there is access to advanced hires. It is something which I think I said yesterday, um, so apologies if I'm repeating myself on this point, but it is something that we're looking at within the work that we're doing on the, the learner journey uh, to see whether um, there are any um, barriers to a young person um, picking a particular um, career or, or moving forward. Um, based on, on what's um, available within their, their senior fees. So we do recognise that that is um, a very, very important part of a young person's um, journey through um, school and onto an apprenticeship college or university. Uh, so it is something which has been taken part, um, part of the learner journey work. Um, and as I said to Tavish Scott, we'll report back within the, the coming months on that. OK. Um, I wanted to go back uh, just briefly as well to the previous issue. Um, around uh, displacement. Um, and I, I was interested, um, because my understanding was at the moment there's, a, I mean, there are thousands of students who apply to university in Scotland who don't get any place at all. Um, and I just wondered what analysis had, had been done to, to look at why those students were missing out. Well, it is um, very difficult to determine why a particular individual um, doesn't get a place at a particular university. It's one of the aspects which the commissioners looked at around um, the requirement for much more transparency around the admissions process. Now, as autonomous institutions, of course, universities are quite rightly responsible for the, their own admissions process, and they will look at different um, uh, different um, in, inputs into that, whether it's um, examination results, which we spoke about earlier, or personal statements, um, for example. The difficulty a young person has is trying to work out what they have to do and, and then um, how much bearing it's given during that admissions process. And it's then very difficult to try and work out why a young person didn't get in um, was it because of a personal statement not being strong enough? Was it because of exam results and so on? So I think the work that Sir Peter is doing around transparency within the admissions process will help look at that. So what we have at the moment is statistics. We have numbers of statistics for applications. We have numbers of statistics for applicants. Um, and then we have that broken down by institution. What it doesn't tell us is why young people um, don't get a place at one, do get a place at another. And uh, quite rightly, the admissions process is very different at each university. We'd expect nothing less for autonomous institutions. But we don't have a, a, the level of transparency that allows young people to understand and therefore allows them to perhaps um, learn what they would have to do in the sixth year to, to ensure that they get entry or at least give them a better chance of entry. So the issue around transparency is something um, which does need to, to be looked at. And I think that's something that we'll come back to um, in due course, either through the commissioner's work or through the access delivery group, because it's, it's been raised by the commissioner um, um, in his, his annual report. So what worries me and um, other committee members have said the same thing. I mean, I regularly meet uh, young people. I've spoken to head teachers 
who have young people who've exceeded the entry requirements. They phone up uh, institutions to ask uh, why young people from their schools have not uh, been successful. And effectively, they're told uh, that the applications were, were to the required standard. It's just that the competition uh, was, was too great. And you know, I, I just feel those people are also, uh, also missing out. And in some cases, do fall in, uh, into the SIMD20 groups. And we're not seeing those young people go on and therefore other people from those schools then decide that you know they, they can't compete at the level required for those courses and it, it creates a it creates a perception that, that creates a problem and that's why it's important that we look at the transparency to ensure that um uh, that young people do understand um why decisions um are being made it's not often as clear cut as the example um, which you give where they're, they're told that um, um, categorically. We then have to look at um, the greed inflation, which um, I discussed, um, I think, in uh, response to Joanne Lamont's question around how we can tackle greed inflation through um, minimum entry requirements, particularly those from SIMD 20. But I think if there is a greater understanding about why decisions um, are made and how they're being made, uh, that would certainly um, make the system much more effective. OK, I had one uh, final question that was about a more um, immediate concern. Across the past few weeks, I've had a number of teachers um, in my constituency get in touch who are concerned that the new higher exam uh, materials are not going to be ready for them to start teaching in June. Um, do you recognise that that does create an issue, uh, particularly in state schools, in, in terms of for, for teachers and for pupils in, in getting through the hires and achieving the best results they can? Um, and is it is it something you commit to look at? Uh, that's not something that's came across my desk. Obviously, schools were within the remit of the Deputy First Minister, but we'll be ensure uh, that I'll pass uh, Mr Mandel's comments on to the Deputy First Minister um, for his information forward on home from today. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Gillian. Um, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I want to talk more about articulation. It was something that I brought up with uh, Peter Scott when he was in, and I noted that in his report that he was particularly strong on the fact that we still have an issue with a lot of universities not having the same kind of, uh, I suppose, culture around accepting HND, HNC graduates into their institutions at a second year or a third year level in the same way that maybe some of the newer universities do. And I asked him if there was any, I mean, given that universities are autonomous and we've talked about that and that it's absolutely right that they should be autonomous, is there anything realistically that the government can do or the SFC could do to encourage those universities to take a fresh approach to this? Well, I, th I think it is something which um, the universities are, are looking at very seriously. Obviously, one of the work streams which University Scotland carried out following on from the Commission was on articulation, um, chaired by um, Susan Stewart. And it's came up with um, a number of... Um, a number of proposals for universities to, to take forward. Um, and then they're indeed setting up um, new working groups um, with colleges, co-chaired by, uh, indeed, I think, by um, with a college um, principal uh, to look at articulation. So I think it's welcome to see uh, the sector uh, taking um, a, um, a much greater interest in its totality on, on this um, issue and working with uh, hand in hand with the colleges to see that happening. Um, I think my concern would be around the fact that we still don't know from University of Scotland when they would expect to see change and how much change they would expect to see. So this is a, 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 an issue which... Um, we would have uh, looked at um, when we were discussing the Commissioner's annual report, um, which was also cancelled because of the, the bad weather last week, um, but we would have looked at uh, the requirement of a little bit more, more information about um, when, th when changes are going to happen and how large that change is going to be at, at um, different institutions. Uh, so I think it's good to see further progress on it, uh, but I want to see the detail about when that could happen. 
In terms of what can happen from the Scottish Government and th uh, through the Funding Council, again, I would go back to the outcome agreements um, process where we are looking very carefully at what we can do within my letter of guidance um, around um, articulation. Sir Peter Scott, for example, um, suggested um, targets around articulation, um, and I'm, a, I'm interested in looking into that, and we'll discuss that with, obviously, with the sector and with key stakeholders uh, before any decision um, is made on that. We will be discussing this issue within the, the access delivery group. Um, and I think, as I said yesterday, there's, there is a tremendous amount of work going on within the sector um, to take up um, still further the, the um, areas around widening access. Um, and what we would have looked at last week was um, the templates and delivery around recommendations, um, which University of Scotland have put a tremendous amount of work into. Um, but it's to see a little bit more detail about when those um, changes um, will, be, um, will be made on that. You won't be surprised to hear as a former college lecturer that whose students, um, many of whom went on to university after doing their HND in the course that I taught, that I found that they did particularly well at university because they'd had college almost as a, as a bridging mechanism from school. A lot of maybe quite young students or maybe students that just, just maybe needed the college kind of uh, experience in order to perform well at university. Has there been any work done in, um, I suppose, analysing the success of students who've articulated into second or third year at university successfully in terms of maybe their, their, um, their final degree result, but also um, the, the, the retention rate um, around that? Because that's one of the, the issues. Certainly, somebody went to university at 17 and found it a bit, a bit of a daunting experience. If you've gone to college first and you've had that student experience and then you go into university, is there work, been work done around that? Because I think there's maybe a perception that uh, students coming from college are not ready for university or, or, or are in some way a, a, a secondary quality a, a applicant as compared to someone leaving school with five hires at A grade. But that's actually um, not my experience, and I wonder if there's been any analysis of that done. Well, it's certainly something I can come back to the committee on in terms of, of um, analysis of it, but I, I would um, I agree with your point that... Um, sometimes going <clears throat> for a young person, sometimes going to college and then university is the right step for them rather than going directly into university. And indeed, um, I had a, a very interesting discussion um, when I was up in Aberdeen um, with um, Nescol and with um, Robert Gordon University um, around the work that they do to ensure that students who perhaps started college with no... Um, concept of, of going to university actually are encouraged then, if it's the right thing for them, uh, to go to a university um, after that. So uh, they work very closely as a college and a university to ensure that, that's, um, that, that, that works for, for the young person. Uh, there is much made sometimes of the, the different ways of learning between college and university. Um, there's much made of um, the differences between colleges and universities, as if that should in some way, um, in some way excuse us and make it too difficult. Um, actually, the, the, the work that goes on, whether it's um, Nescol and Robert Gordon's, whether it's Forth Valley and Stirling, demonstrate that articulation works very well for students. Um, it opens up new avenues to them, as I say, that they perhaps would never have thought of when they were 17, 18, and looking at the prospectuses um, to, to begin with. So it's certainly something that, that we will um, look very seriously at, that the Funding Council will look very seriously at, to ensure that we're getting over these perceptions about it's just too hard to align the curriculums. In some areas, um, yes, it's exceptionally difficult to, to align curriculums. In some areas, it's not. Um, and we should just get on and ensure that articulation um, um, progresses, full articulation progresses at a greater <coughs> speed than it is at the moment. And um, moving on to another area, because I'm the European reporter for the committee, so I'm going to ask some um, 
be remiss of me to not mention something in College of Scotland's submission to us. They mentioned about EU funding programmes around employability, uh, particularly the European Social Fund, and they've set out just how much colleges in Scotland actually get from the European Social Fund. And they say that um, particularly pe uh, people who are quite far away from the workforce that a lot of these employment programmes that are run by colleges could be losing out in a substantial amount of money uh, after Brexit. So I, I wanted to, to bring that up with you and, and to ask about um, any planning from the Scottish Government for that shortfall. It's a very interesting point because often when we talk about the implications around Brexit, we talk about it um, through the prism of universities and the, there are, are undoubtedly um, major challenges um, for our universities because of, of Brexit. Uh, but we have um, been um, very um, aware that colleges are affected um, by this too. So both myself um, and Michael Russell have met with College Scotland and different institutions um, on uh, numerous occasions to talk through them um, in detail with them. There is, you know, for, for example, uh, um, developing the Scotland's um, workforce um, um, funding which comes in to, um, to colleges, uh, which will undoubtedly um, have um, 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 a consequence if, if such funding is, is to be um, no longer made available to our colleges. But I think what the important aspect that we're doing um, and continue to do with the colleges is working with them, working with the sector um, to see what can be done. Now, obviously, we would, um, as a government, um, wish to see um, exceptionally close collaboration on colleges and universities um, following on from, from Brexit and a continuation um, of many of the, the, the um, avenues which are available to college and university um, students. It's a difficult area um, to make a, 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 a defined final statement on at the moment, <laughs> um, but I hope you can be reassured that we're working with Colleges Scotland um, and with University Scotland to analyse the, the, um, the impact of, of Brexit um, on, on both sectors. It's also a perception that Erasmus only affects universities as well, but in fact, as somebody who took students over to Finland many times, when I was a college lecturer, Erasmus is something that's very much embedded in our college programme as well. So around the discussions around the continuation of any kind of Erasmus uh, programme, uh, I imagine that, that, that you are advocating for colleges as well. Has that uh, absolutely. And, and indeed, the, the work that, that goes on within our communities as well. I think I answered a question to Joan McAlpine recently on Erasmus+, Plus, um, where um, I, I put on record that the, the government's commitment um, to, to Erasmus+, Plus, um, and the recognition that, uh, again, we often talk about um, Erasmus+, Plus being for, for university students, but the college and indeed um, community aspects um, around Erasmus Plus um, is very, very um, important. Um, 2017 was the most popular year for Erasmus Plus in the UK so far. Um, perhaps another um, example of how our young people um, wish to maintain close links with Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne, and then Ross. Okay, I mean, I would like to maybe um, add something to questions later about student support, but I wanted to ask a very specific question about uh, widening access and funding and then a more general question about education policy. My understanding is that in the past, universities would have been funded for specific widening access places, and I think now in the guidance it says that funding has been mainstreamed into core funding. What leverage will you now have in those universities who basically stepped away from their responsibility around widening access while others have stepped up to the challenge? Well, we do provide um, £51 million um, a, a year um, for widening access and articulation um, places within um, the, the universities. Um, what I, I wish to see, though, and it goes back to my point of ensuring that we change the system and we make the system fair is that we will do this through the outcome agreements process where um, each university is required to look very carefully at its um, aspirations and its targets around widening access and the Scottish Funding Council will, will hold them to account through that intensification of outcome agreements process. Uh, so we do take um, the issue very seriously around, um, um, around ensuring that every single university um, plays its part and that's why we'll do that through an outcomes agreements process which affects every single university 
uh, done on an individualised basis. No, I don't think I understand that, but that may be. But that may simply be me. In the past, monies went to universities for widening access places. Now it's part of their core funding. So what leverage do you have on universities who are not stepping up to the plate? Well, I, as I said, what I'm interested in is what's the rationale behind changing the position. Well, we are still, um, we do still have funding of, of 51, 51 million pound uh, per annum for widening access. Um, streamed in with respect, because that's what the guidance says. It, says. it says the funding is mainstreamed into core funding to universities. It, well, well it's, it's there as our, our requirement to, to ensure that there are places for widening access and articulation. But when we're looking at the outcome agreements um, process, the reason why it's important is, again, I don't want to see widening access as something which we sort or attempt to sort through having a certain number of places for widening access and a certain number of places for articulation through certain funding streams. I want to see the system change. The system will only change if we hold the institutions to account through the outcomes agreements process. So while we'll continue to look very seriously at our funding about widening access, um, around retention and around the work that the Scottish Funding Council um, does through its strategic funds on widening access, we will not solve widening access unless we change the system in its entirety. And the way to do that is through the intensification of outcome agreements. So we've seen recently um, that we have published, um, we have published the um, um, initial uh, proposals for uh, university and college um, funding. What the process that will be gone through now with university and colleges is as analysis with the Funding Council about their draft outcome agreements, how um, ambitious they are. They, they'll work through that process with the Funding Council um, and therefore their final allocation of funding will be based on their um, outcome agreements uh, that are agreed with the Funding Council. Yeah. Will there be financial penalties to universities that don't meet targets? Well, as I've said, it, we've had the initial allocations come out, I think it was last week, the Funding Council will now go through every uh, draft outcome agreement with the institutions. And if they are not living up to our expectations when it comes to outcome, um, when it comes to widening access or indeed um, other strategic matters for the government, then you will see a change in the funding allocation from that through the drafting process. OK. Can I ask if there's any analysis done of what courses young people are going into from um, more deprived areas? Because I'm sure you would share my concern that we had, if we have widening access, but disproportionately we continue to see the same folk ending up in, say, the professions, medicine and law, where there's a great deal of competition. And young people, when you're trying to level the playing field, don't have access to these courses. Is there an analysis of where young people are going? Uh, we can certainly furnish the, the committee with the, the information um, on that. And it's um, an area, again, which the, the, the data working group, which I, I've mentioned um, in a number of answers now, um, will be looking at to see what, what more information um, that we can um, pull out. Um, I would say when it comes to the professions, it is an issue which we do recognise, and that's why there is um, specific um, funding um, based from the Funding Council uh, to look at encouraging young people into the professions um, from high schools that don't have um, um, a, a great background in ensuring that young people get into uh, law and to, to medicine and from dentistry, for example. And that encourages the young person um, at quite an early stage in the, the senior phase to look at what else they have to do, because it goes back to the fact that it's not just their grades that matter, but their personal statements um, and indeed um, other work that they do around that. So uh, there is, um, through the Funding Council, um, already initiatives that go on, particularly to look at the professions of law, dentistry and medicine. And, and the last question I want to ask is what conversations you have with your colleagues within education in terms of the impact of the budget choices that have been made further down the system, which inevitably will impact on widening access. We know, for example, currently we are seeing fewer support staff, fewer um, people, home links teachers, people who would support young people who are 
you know, who need at primary school, secondary school to actually get embedded in the education system, that must inevitably have a consequence for young people even competing to even think about going to university. So what representations have you made in terms of education ministers to the finance minister around some of the choices he's making, which in my view are very, very damaging in the longer term for young people to even think about going to university? Well, of course, the choices around um, education are for local authorities to make within um, their budgetary process. We do look very seriously. Minister, you must have, have... Did you make a representation to the Finance Secretary about budget choices you, you would like to see, which would enable local authorities to ensure the support at school level that allow young people even to think about going on to further and higher education? That is a, that's a ministerial... It's a, it's a wonderful power to have to have the decision round budget priorities. You have that choice. What representations have you and your education colleagues made to the finance sector to ensure that young people in school can be supported in a way that can even think about going to further and higher education? Well, certainly within the budget process uh, that we've just gone through, we've uh, seen a real terms increase both for universities and for colleges. And that what representations ensure... did you make as ministers? I'm not asking what the budget says. I'm asking what your role is in influencing the budget. Uh, and now let her answer. And I would like to think that the um, um, information that the committee has through the budget process um, which has uh, demonstrated the real terms increase for universities and colleges um, is testimony to the hard work that the um, education ministers put in in making representations for the finance secretary. Decisions for local councils are for them to make and for them to be responsible for at a local level. So the decisions made at school level, which mean that young people are less likely even to be able to think about further and higher education, are nothing to do with you. But if people go to university, then that is your responsibility and you're increasing that budget. Do you see the connection between how we fund our school system and ability to access further and higher education? No, Do you no, accept no, us a connection? What we're doing here now is we're fighting the budget process. That we no, just with respect, I'm, asking, exactly I'm asking the minister, does she see yeah, a connection no, between the, the investment in school budgets in order to make real our aspiration, our shared aspiration, to widen access to further and higher education. We certainly recognise the whole systems approach that we required within education. That's why when we have the access delivery group, we have representatives from primary schools, from secondary schools um, and from local authorities within that. Um, we are um, very um, aware, with, particularly within the learner journey work, that we look at how the different sections of the education system um, work and collaborate. <coughs> the decisions for local councils are for them um, to, to um, make representations for us. And your themselves. budget yeah. decision the local government doesn't have any impact <laughs> in that? As, as I said, we're not fighting the, the budget that we've already, the process we've already been through, Claire. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, and the previous question touched on um, the, the access to particular courses uh, in terms of uh, the competition for the likes of law and medicine and dentistry. Has there been any work done to um, look at those universities who choose to have an additional application um, uh, process in that, where they have to, students have to pay a fee? It can be re refunded to them if they access certain benefits, but there are some institutions that use that as a selection process. And I, w I just wondered if, if, if the minister had, uh, if the data group was going to be looking at whether that was impacting and creating an additional barrier for, for young people from SIMD areas to actually um, aspire to those um, subjects like the law. Mm. It certainly is a concern, um, as I mentioned earlier, around the opaqueness of the system and uh, the inherent barriers that are within that, um, particularly if you're from um, a high school that doesn't send a lot of young people um, to particular types of, of courses. It's um, therefore more, more challenging for, for the young person and the school to support them. Um, that's why uh, the Funding Council does um, look to, to um, encourage initiatives um, based on that. So any barrier um, perceived or actual out there that will, be, um, that will stop a young person from applying for a course will need to, to, to be looked at. Um, some of these 
you know, well, when it comes to admissions, obviously they are decisions for um, the universities to have as autonomous institutions. Uh, but through the Access Delivery Group, I am hopeful um, that we can work together coming round, um, yes, challenging each other um, where needs be, but working collegiately to find a way through some of the challenges that can perhaps easier dealt with and this uh, would perhaps maybe be one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ross. Thank you, uh, thank you Minister. Minister. The student support review was published in November. Could you indicate in what month the government will publish your response? Well, we're hoping to um, to reply to Parliament um, um, soon on that. Um, the reason why I, I, I won't give a, a, a specific um, number uh, or, or as a date or a, a month to that is we're we're currently still going through modelling of um, different. Um, proposals that we could bring forward. Um, and what I don't want to do is come before Parliament until that work has been complete. You'll then get a half answer from the government on some of them, and then we'll then have to come back to Parliament um, to, to, um, um, to reply to, to other aspects of it. Um, so I am hopeful we, we would be able to reply to Parliament soon. I can assure members I am as keen um, to, to get this process moving um, as, as others are. But until we look at that financial um, modelling, um, I, I don't think we're in a position to be able to, prevent, uh, to, to present to Parliament um, a, a full picture on that. The reason we're doing the financial modelling is, as I said, I think in response to Ian Gray yesterday, that we want to do this um, with the first principle of ensuring um, that those from the poorest backgrounds um, get the support that they require. So we'll look to see the different changes that we could make and the impact that that would have um, on different demographics. We don't want any unintended consequences um, coming through um, or, or any decision that we make that actually we could make in a different way to assist the poorest students the best. In, in terms of your response, you used the phrase a moment ago about um, a whole system approach within education. Um, I'm looking for an assurance that the whole system approach is something wider than that, because we know from evidence across decades um, that some of the major barriers to equal access to education are issues around housing, transport, transport costs being a, an example where the government's response could be through your portfolio to simply increase loans or preferably bursaries to try and compensate for the rising cost of public transport. Or you could look at transport policies such as expanding concessionary travel to uh, those in full-time education, fare capping. Could you explain how the government is taking a genuinely whole system approach to this and not trying to tackle it simply within the education portfolio? Because a lot of these challenges occur out with education and have an impact on it. I think you're, you're absolutely right to point to the, the myriad of different ways that, that, that these... Um challenges could um, could could be overcome um, one of the, the the areas that I will have to look at very seriously following the review was that the the review um, group asked the government to carry out further work on specific areas so that it hasn't came back with a specific recommendation on, on quite a few areas and that's by no means a criticism of the group because they have went through I think quite a, a, a radical approach to what they're um, suggesting and um, particularly when it comes to, to, to further education and quite rightly spent um, um, a great deal of time um, shaping that so we'll have to look at um, our response um, and see what we need to do as a government to pick up the requests which the review asked us um, to look at in more detail and then absolutely not just look at it through the prism of, of education, but to, to look at it in, in, in a wider aspect. So I'm very mindful of that as, as we move forward. So I can assume that when the, when the government does respond, there'll be evidence in there that you have taken a, a, a whole system approach rather than an educational approach. I, I, I certainly hope that, that that will come through. I'm, 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 sure, um, I'm sure Mr Gray will pick me up on it if there's um, aspects of it that we've, we've not looked at. Um, but it is our um, initial response to the review. And as I said yesterday, there are some aspects around this that will um, require us to do um, further work. And then, therefore, there will be um, opportunities for, um, for members to, um, um, to feed into that process and, indeed, for members of the public and stakeholders as well. 
Thank you. And um, I'm going to ask one of the questions that was uh, submitted to us by a member of the public. Um, from 2013, the government made a decision to shift quite significantly from uh, grants and, and bursaries towards uh, student loans. Has any um, evidence been gathered on the effect that that's had on student behaviour? Well, the decisions that we took in 2013 um, were ones which were supported by NUS at that time to look at, for example, um, a guaranteed minimum income from those from the, the poorest background. I do recognise that, that times um, have moved on, and that's indeed why we have um, the, the independent um, review for, for student support. Um, when we're looking at the um, assessment of the impact, um, I suppose I would... Um, suggest that um, we look at the, the school leaver destination statistics that were recently published, um, which showed an increase in leavers from their most deprived communities going into to higher education. Um, and some of the statistics I pointed to earlier, um, which examined um, the, the number of young people, increased number of young people from the most deprived communities um, that are now entering um, university um, as compared to um, previous years. I th there's a large amount of evidence um, from the last five years that has been gathered from a range of approaches. I suppose what I'm asking specifically is, has the government deliberately gathered evidence to assess the impact of this policy specifically, rather than look to evidence gathered from a range of other directions and try to draw a conclusion? Um, well, it's, it's very difficult um, in, in any um, policy remit to look at one change in a policy when um, other aspects have been happening, for example, the, you know, the, the, the economic crisis which um, be, be, befell um, um, many, a couple of years ago now. So you can't look at, I'd say it's almost impossible to look at one policy and say that one policy changed a young person's um, attitude. But what we have looked at and what we continue to look at very seriously is the school leaver destinations and the amount of young people that are coming through. And we also take very seriously our, our work um, directly with, with young people um, to ask them about what influences their decisions. Um, the work that we're doing through the learner journey has um, included um, a analysis which um, Young Scott, for example, took, um, took part in and, and facilitated for the Scottish Government, where we were directly asking young people, as best as you can, what influences your decisions um, in life to do an apprenticeship, to do um, a college course or a university? So I think we have made um, an effort, to particularly to go to young people, to look at what influences them um, while looking at the official statistics um, as well. What often comes through from, from the young people is um, a requirement for us to um, encourage young people to pick what's right for, for them and to not perhaps pigeonhole them too early about those that will go to university, those that will go to college or those that will go to apprenticeship. And that came through very strongly in our work. So I think we have done, um, 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 as best we can, analysis of what determines a, a young person's um, views on the education process um, through, through our learner journey. But I would, as I said at the start of my answer, um, not claim that that is an exact science. And just one uh, brief final question, um, Kimbir, uh, and returns to Joey Martin's point around European funding. Um, do you know what proportion of uh, total funding on widening access projects comes from European funding streams? And has the government uh, developed work on contingency planning for if those streams are not either continued or replaced? Well, when, when it comes to the, the college um, statistics, which um, I, I spoke to Gillian Martin um, about, um, there is um, analysis through developing Scotland's workforce, but some of that may touch on widening access. But I would by no means claim um, that um, it is, is completely around widening access. That's why we're looking at this um, on quite a, a granular basis with different institutions to see how it affects them in different ways. Um, whether it's universities or colleges, they will be affected different types of courses, different types of academics. Um, and within colleges, uh, we will see a different demand from EU nationals who are already resident here, for example, which is a different challenge to, to what we're, we're seeing at the universities where EU um, applicants tend to come to study here. Um, so we're 
working with the institutions um, to look at that um, in a very detailed basis so we can then gain um, um, enough analysis and enough knowledge to be able to take uh, the types of steps which, which you suggest around um, mitigation. So we're working very hard with the sector uh, to see what can be done um, in a very detailed fashion rather than just looking at a, a pot of money and deciding um, um, what, it's, what it's spent on. It needs to be looked at by institution by institution and indeed sometimes by course type. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've been joined by Mary Fee, who's come from her other committee. And Mary, I believe you've got a question around STEM. Yes, uh, thank you, Convener. And, and can I start by apologising both to committee and to the Minister and officials? I was at a private bill committee, um, so that explains my um, lateness. I just wanted to ask um, one general question around STEM and a specific um, question relating um, to STEM. I wonder, Minister, if you could give us an update on whether or not um, any pieces of work have been done to refresh and update the STEM strategy, because we, we, we constantly hear there are issues around um, people who are interested in science subjects going on to do, whether it's apprenticeships or, or going to courses in colleges and colleges and universities. And I just wonder if there are any pieces of work going on to ensure that the right support is there, so that people, when they have an interest in science subjects, don't drop out. Absolutely right that that is an issue that, that we do need to look at. So following on from the STEM strategy, we haven't refreshed the STEM strategy, it's, it's still um, quite new, but what we do now have is an implementation group um, which um, I chair which looks at all the different, in, in some ways, com um, comparable to, to the Access Delivery Group for Widening Access, where we bring all the stakeholders around the table. Um, we're um, looking at KPIs to ensure that there is um, progress to deliver the STEM strategy. And um, the point that, that, that you've mentioned is, is, is one area which we'll, we'll be keen to look at. Um, we'll also look um, to have an advisory group that will advise the implementation group, um, so built up from a, a wider pool of, of people, um, to ensure that we're, we're receiving um, um, Timmy's um, advice um, on that. So both the implementation and the advisory group are moving forward. Um, we're also um, very aware of the work that's going through from the Royal Society of Edinburgh, who are refreshing the tapping all their talents um, work that they did um, a few years ago now. Um, and officials um, have, have met with um, the RSE. I've met with the RSE to see um, and to, to offer any assistance we can as they go through that process, because I think um, we have made progress, um, but I would readily admit that when we refresh tapping all the talents, it will flush out more challenges that the government needs to take on. So we're very keen to, to, to work with the RSE to provide them with any information, any data um, or that we have that will assist in that refresh of tapping all our talents. OK, that's, that's helpful. And of course, sometimes it can be very young children that have a particular um, interest in science. And you'll be aware that the Scottish Schools Education Research Centre provides training for primary teachers um, to teach science subjects. And you also make sure that primary schools are health and safety compliant. Now, currently, that, that uh, centre is funded by all local authorities. Um, will the education forms, reforms that are currently being looked at have any impact on either the procurement of those services or the centre itself? I certainly don't see any reason why there would be um, a change to, to the support that comes um, to, to the, the centre. Um, it's something which also, uh, my understanding is, receives money from the, the Scottish Government, and we were um, um, very um, pleased to be able to, to ensure that that work um, continues as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Joanne wants to come in again briefly on something that was spoken earlier, and then Claire. Yes, um, my apologies. I wanted just to go back briefly to the, the, the discussion you had with Ross Greer around student <coughs> support. Um, and the Minister referred yesterday to the Government having raised the income threshold for maximum grant to £19,000. Um, for completeness, of course, the Minister is aware that in 2013 the SNP Government cut the income cut off for maximum bursary from £19,300 to £17,000. Do you think it's appropriate to pitch not quite restoration of a cut as an increase? And would you accept that the decision in 2000, the position of the NUS notwithstanding, was actually wrong because it had direct impact on some of the lowest income people in, in uh, education? 
Well, I think I was asked yesterday what action the government had uh, taken in um, in um, the the uh, context of the review of student support. Um, so my, my answer um, yesterday was to demonstrate the action that we've um, taken both from the review of student support um, and our commitment within the programme for government, uh, but also why we um, uh, didn't wait uh, when it comes um, to raising the income threshold for, for the review of student support. So it was a demonstration of action um, within the last few years. As I said, um, I think in my response to, to Ross Greer, decisions that were taken at the time to simplify the process um, around student support were, well, were welcomed at the time um, by um, NUS. But I do recognise that we have uh, moved on, uh, circumstances um, change, and we do need to look um, afresh at that. So the decisions um, were taken um, working hand in hand with stakeholders at the time and welcomed by the NUS. Uh, but I think it's right that we look to see uh, what changes need to be made and that's why we asked an independent um, review to look at that for us and we'll respond in due course. You accept, not, notwithstanding the position of the NUS, that it was wrong because you've tried now to write it rather than have an increase, you've not quite righted it, that it was wrong to disproportionately have an impact on those who most relied on bursaries. And we've well, tried in a way, you're, 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 the, these you're are political almost... Slogans now. I mean, uh, can, can you ask the Minister a question that, that relates right, that to, case, to her uh, remit? If you're not able to do it just now, I think we'd be interested in the analysis that drove you, or brought you to the conclusion that you should not quite restore the cut that you made, as opposed to the analysis you had at the time, which justified that cut in 2013. The decisions in 2013 were around simplifying the system and we worked hand in hand with stakeholders to ensure that that happened. Uh, but we are always, um, um, we're always open to, uh, to looking at changing um, a system as time moves on um, and as the challenges to our young people change over time. And that's exactly why we looked at the independent review and would why I'll respond to that in due course. My apologies, but would you accept that simplifying the system is not the same as having a direct cut to the income of some of the poorest students in our communities. Because that's not simplifying the system. It's a direct cut to the bursary. We're going to move on because you're here to, to talk about your, your remit just now and, and what, we're, what Joanne seems to be doing is trying to rewrite history. Claire? Um, thank you, Kivya. I just wanted to put on record... Presented a cut as an oh. <laughs> thank you, Kivya. Um, I just wanted to put on record, as a substitute to the committee, that I'm actually vice chair of CERC at the moment, since it's been raised during the process. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Um, I, I've got one question, uh, Minister. You, you talked a couple of times about valuing the other choices, not just universities. Um, and I have no doubt that you do, and the Scottish Government does, and that many other people do. But how do we ensure that teachers and parents and pupils value these choices eh, and don't just try and push the university thing, A, because it might look good for the school, or B, because they, they genuinely think it's the right thing for the pupils. Because there are many parents and grandparents eh, and others who would think that the best thing for their child, grandchild, etc., is going to university, but the reality is that it's something else entirely. I think it's a very fair point, and, and obviously, uh, particularly in apprenticeship um, week, I'm um, very uh, keen to um, encourage young people to look at the different opportunities that are available to them that are um, out with um, my, own, my own remit. And I had a very interesting um, visit as part of apprenticeship week to um, a school in my own constituency as minister yesterday where we talked about foundation apprenticeships and um, the, the new opportunities that are available to young people um, at school through foundation apprenticeships. You do um, hit on a, on, a, on a very critical point that it's not just the nice words that we say in government um, and in speeches that, that matter on this, but it's ensuring that there's nothing in the system um, that is um, pushing or encouraging young people towards one outcome more than another. And we're looking um, at that within the learner journey. One of the aspects which 
the learner journey has as its heart is about parity of esteem. And it is about encouraging young people um, and their influencers, whether it's um, a, their teachers or, or family, to pick the right course for, for them. And I, I go back to the conversations I've had with young people who have um, went to a university because they had the grades to allow them to do that. But actually, with hindsight, they left the university, um, attended a college course, and have went on very successfully in a career. So we need to ensure that um, we are all um, cognizant of the opportunities which are before our young people. And it's about what's choosing right for that young person, not what's right for statistics about levels of higher education or further education going up and down, but what's right for that young person? And we need to be brave in perhaps making some changes um, to, to ensure that that happens in due course. I encourage to hear that. Ross, very briefly, and uh, a short answer. Brief. Uh, Minister, there's a massive disparity in the funding that college student associations receive. I think the lowest is around 20 grand a year and the highest is around 200 grand a year. Has the government considered ring fencing of student association funding uh, in the college funding formula? Well, the Funding Council is, is working within NUS, indeed um, still funding um, some work with, within NUS to encourage the, the growth of um, student associations within colleges. Um, I recognise on the visits that I have within colleges the difference uh, that that makes to having um, a very um, strong, confident, robust student body. Indeed, saw that when I was at Ayrshire College very recently speaking to the student reps um, who sit on the board at Ayrshire College. And it further demonstrates why we need to ensure uh, that uh, students have a, a strong representation both um, at college and university level. With that I will bring the, to an end the public part of the meeting. I want to thank you and Mr Smart and Mr Macdonald for your attendance and we will now move into private session. Thank you.